uh, happy Monday night. Uh, thank you so much for taking time. Or is it Tuesday? No, it's Monday. My, my days are all scrambled uh, now that it's summer. Um, on behalf of the entire American Red Cross and our IHL program here at National Headquarters, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules. Uh, to those on the call who are educators, I know that you're on the back end of an especially uh, busy year. In fact, you may be still finishing that school year. And so we really thank you uh, tremendously for taking time to be here today and, and to open yourselves up to uh, some new avenues uh, to touch on some really relevant topics. My name is Thomas Harper. I'm the Senior Counsel for International Humanitarian Law for the American Red Cross here at National Headquarters. And it's my distinct pleasure to help run the IHL program here. As you may or may not know, we're the, the mission that we execute in terms of uh, teaching and educating the American public about IHL and the protections that it offers during armed conflict is a volunteer-led mission. In fact, uh, more than 95% of our uh, instructors out in the field, uh, our, our uh, youth volunteers, they're all volunteers. They're, they're folks that uh, have found a passion in this area, have found a passion for connecting with their community members, their classmates, students, the, the, uh, the, the audience that, uh, audiences that we reach run the gamut. <clears throat> but what unifies them is a passion for connecting with others and imparting this really critical knowledge. And you're part of the latest chapter of that. So I wanna thank all of you tonight. Without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, my colleague, Taya Anderson. Taya is our esteemed Henry P. Davison IHL fellow. Uh, she's been a great member of the team for the last year now. Uh, she's going to be leading the ship. We're going to shuffle the order of the presentation just a little bit as we sort out some, some technical uh, audio issues. It's um, just the case with Zoom as we're all used to, but uh, not to worry. So if you have uh, materials with you and, and you find that we're going a little out of order, that's the reason why we're just trying to accommodate those issues. Ogden, can you hear us? Yes, I can finally hear you. Look at that. Can you hear me? I, I speak about a, a technical change and we solve it mid-sentence. So this is perfect. I just always <laughs> need to make those predictions. So I will be quiet. Taya, I'll hand over the reins uh, to you and enjoy the presentation, everyone. Thank you. So, Tia, are, are Thank you, you so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am up and running. I'm up and running, hopefully, too. Uh, apologize okay. for you know the slight delay we might may or may not have because of technical is issues. Uh, we've also had a last minute shuffle of instructors, so I am subbing for the amazing Amy, which means we're going to simplify her part a little bit. Um, but I think you're still going to get a lot out of it. And so, what I would like everyone to do, if they can, is to put in the chat while I bring up our presentation, our slide deck for the evening, is to put in the chat. Um, where in the country you're uh, calling in from and whether or not you're an educator. And then I will bring up the slide deck. I apologize for saying country. Immediately we have people outside of the country. I think it's phenomenal. We, we've got someone all the way from Okinawa, Japan, which is truly tremendous. Thanks for making time to join us. And good morning to you. So let me see. Okay, here we go. So I hope everyone can see the slides. I hope someone from the American Red Cross will tell me if you can see the slides. This is our Exploring Humanitarian Law program where we are trying to help you, guide you through um, some resources that were developed by the ICRC and, and how to implement some teachings about IHL, humanitarian law into your teaching, um, either piecemeal or as a full module. Um, and we're gonna take you through uh, five of those sessions, uh, we'll teach these sessions or go over them in three, um, over three nights. Today we'll have uh, session one and uh, two. I'll go into the agenda a little further um, in the next slide. So the goal here is ba basically to provide you some knowledge, go over the exercises, we'll also go over some of the fundamental principles and rules, applications of humanitarian law. 
So just some strategies. So we have a combination of instructors with military background, with legal background, with educational background. And so we're hoping to uh, impart you with all the different perspectives of what to bring to your students. Uh, we'll all be here to answer questions in, in all the different parts of this program. Today, we'll have uh, two people with both legal and two people with legal background, one person with military background, one person with educational background. And that's how basically all of the sessions will be. Uh, the agenda for today is, as I mentioned before, to go over session one and two. Uh, Ogden will lead us through the humanitarian perspective with uh, a few different exercises that we'll go through. And then I will start us off with fundamental principles of international humanitarian law, a couple of exercises, and then one of my other colleagues from the American Red Cross will go over the his history and fundamental principles of IHL. <clears throat> and uh, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I will be watching the chat when I'm not uh, presenting and come back after I present and hopefully get them to whoever you need them to go to. Um, hopefully we'll be able to see some of you in uh, the next uh, go around, but we just weren't, we weren't able to set up, set that up for this one. Now that we know approximately how many you are, I think that's still uh, doable. You're about a class. So um, we'll see if we can get to that. But for now, just use the chat to communicate with us and we'll try to get to any and all questions that you have. This is really a time for you. Uh, if you know you're not getting it, if there's something we can help you with, we're here for you. Um, we're thinking we are gonna spend about an hour to an hour and a half going through the material. And so that should give you plenty of time to ask questions. Any preliminary things that uh, you see in the chat, Thomas, before we go into our first presenter? Yeah, uh, so uh, Thema Logan had a question. What's the grade level for instruction? What's this designed for? 13 to 18, if I remember correctly. I'm I'm not able to see the the actual, <laughs> I think Octon is trying to use American Sign Language <clears throat> to show it. Uh, I don't have the, I because I have the presentation up, I'm not able to also see the program at the same time, but I'm sure Ogden, uh, who has taught this, will be able to help you out with that. And luckily he's our first presenter. Certainly so, grade six. <clears throat> You, you could go grade six to, quite frankly, um, undergraduate. Um, I've, I've taught juniors and seniors um, who respond to a number of different modules in this in this series. Would you like me? Oh, there's me. Oh, let me. Hi, folks, and welcome to this exciting presentation. Um, I'm excited and privileged uh, to be here this evening. Let me first, uh, as a point of fact, make uh, an observation that uh, I am now luckily the retired Dean of the College of Education and Professional Studies. Uh, and I'm an emeritus professor of social work. Um, what we're gonna do over the next three nights is, is hopefully paint an exciting story about the Exploring Humanitarian Law curriculum. And um, since I believe that every good story always has a backstory or a prologue, I need to give you a little context of mine. Uh, I've been with the American Red Cross, like many baby boomers, since probably about age five or six, as I began to learn how to swim. The Red Cross taught me how to swim it taught me how to lifeguard. It taught me how to be a first aid instructor. Uh, and I think I took my first real volunteer position at about age 15 as a blood services registrar. Warp speed into the future. And I served for about 15 years uh, after I got out of various graduate schools as a clinical social worker in public and private, um, inpatient and outpatient psychiatry, and as a disaster mental health specialist with the United States Public Health Service. 
warp speed again to 1994 when I gave up after about 15 years of practice to become a full-time academic um, at the Lake Wobegon School of the University of Wisconsin River Falls, which is in so far in Western Wisconsin, it ought to be in Minnesota. The first thing I did, or at least the first thing I realized when I moved to River Falls was my house was within seven miles of a nuclear power plant. And uh, since I hadn't been with the Red Cross for some time, I tried to knock on the local door to find out where was and who was my Red Cross chapter in far western Wisconsin. And I found out, oh, it's me and about eight other little ladies. Um, it led me to wanting to reinvigorate my chapter. And I did this through the process of, I figured, well, I'm at a college of education. I'm going to be filled with eager undergraduate students who will probably want to learn something, except that uh, I realized that it probably wouldn't be very cost effective to turn them all into disaster volunteers, considering we only had about two house fires per year in Pierce County. And there's nothing worse than getting people all dressed up for a party and then not having one for them. I called international services to, because I remembered when I was in fifth grade, I used to fill world, little friendship boxes. I thought, well, maybe there's a hook there. And they told me, please, God, don't fill any more friendship boxes. We already have 100,000 of them in a warehouse, and we can't get rid of them. And I said, well, geez, what can I do? And someone said, well, what do you know about the IHL? And I said, I don't know anything about the IHL. And uh, I got turned on to an instructor over in the Twin Cities. And uh, we sat and we chatted. And he said, you know, why don't you bring some students over and we'll do an IHL course. And we so I took 25 students over the course of three weekends. And we did the entire, back then in the early 90s, the humanity in the face of war uh, curriculum that was an IHL curriculum. And after those three weekends, uh, I held a focus group with those pe young people. And I was shocked because the first reaction to my first question was, well, in retrospect, what do you all think? And they were furious there was anger all over the place. And I thought, oh, great, here I am, a brand new junior professor, and I just ticked off 22 undergraduate students. And it turned out that the anger, when we explored it, was basically, how did I get through high school? And I've never heard about these important rules limiting the effects of armed conflict. And I knew then that this was obviously a package that needed to be explored. Warp speed to the year 2000, and somebody at National asked me to take a look at this brand new curriculum that had come out of development with the ICRC and the um, uh, curriculum development company in Massachusetts. And I sat down with the materials <clears throat> at a workshop that I was attending at the time and came back and said, I'm excited, this is terrific stuff, but it's about 40 hours of material. There's no way it's gonna be inserted into American K through 12 education in all one lump. And we need to start thinking about strategies to reach out to educators and uh, give them an opportunity to figure out, uh, learn, learn the material and decide what they wanted to use for the material and uh, slice it and dice it the way that professional K through 12 educators and undergraduate educators are trained to do. Um, so we, back in the early times, we, we ran a, a, a crosswalk with the National Council on Social Studies uh, Act requirements. And then we ran a, a couple of years in a row. Uh, we did some national teacher trainings and uh, I did a follow-up study of, well, what was the effect of this stuff uh, on the educators that we, that we introduced to the material? And generally what I found was it was exciting material, 
teachers were excited by it. Um, they did indeed carve it up and use it the way they wanted to. Um, the material, uh, in a nutshell, offers wonderful opportunities for students to develop critical thinking. It offers wonderful opportunities for young people to begin to develop, um, I'm, I won't use the word morals, but I'll say uh, begin to develop uh, values clarification um, and begin to explore. I mean, we, those of us who work with young people know nothing is as hot and gets them passionate than struggling with issues of right and wrong and bad and good and uh, all that great stuff that first comes out very black and white and then we all realize later on is probably pretty gray sometimes. And that's what's kind of great about this package. Um, the EHL program basically is about the international humanitarian law, which has as its major um, course or purpose, the idea of limiting the effects of armed conflict uh, particularly to those persons who are most vulnerable in armed conflict. Um, there are, um, this, in this original package when it came out, has five major chapters or modules as they're called. Um, throughout the package, there are uh, various things that we will that the package calls explorations, and they 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 operate over ten different methodologies of teaching. Those of you who are K through 12 educators or undergraduate educators will recognize that many of these materials have a what we call a constructivist perspective. Um, so, the, one of the funny things about this package is that initially when it came out in school systems around the world that use basically the lecture and repetition process, the, the package kind of didn't uh, transport or translate very well at all. And uh, the teachers needed to be sort of instructed in how to use things like discussion and small group work um, and, uh, and various different kinds of explorations. Let's take a look at some of the explorations, if we could. Next slide. Uh, was that? Go back. Because there's a key. There's a good point here. Can you go back? To, thanks. Throughout the entire package, you're going to find that um, there are these five key concepts: human dignity, um, a concept that we call the bystander and the upstander. Um, the effects of, uh, of social forces upon people um, to make a choice to help or not to help. Um, throughout the package, you will find that there's a, a number of explorations that put students into a place of questioning, um, sometimes using a dilemma, um, sometimes basically putting people into situations where we have, quote, no easy answer. And um, the other, and the other thing is, what is the what is the basic humanitarian act? What is it the what's it the fundamental um, property of trying to help someone or not help someone, particularly um, in any situation of armed conflict? Module one is called the humanitarian perspective, and what it does is is it outlines these concepts. And it also um, outlines the various methodologies that can be used throughout the other four modules as an instructor or a, um, an educator decides to use various um, processes. Uh, now we can move to the next slide. Uh, which is a, and it could, I've used this a couple of times. Uh, I'm, I, I, I hate icebreakers, but this one's kind of a good one uh, to use for, you need to first sort of introduce students to the concept of, well, why do we need to be talking about this stuff in the first place? And uh, the example of the chairs icebreaker is, 
uh, three cards that are given to people quietly and surreptitiously that basically command three different commands, put chairs near the door, put chairs near the window, or put chairs in a circle. Um, and the major rule of the game is, is nobody can talk to one another. They can use signs if they want to or whatever. But basically what's happened is you you set up a, a situation where uh, there's conflict in the room, but nobody knows kind of exactly what the conflict is. After you have chaos um, for a little bit, uh, you break down and you sort of uh, put up the facilitator's chart and begin a group discussion of, well, how are you feeling? What did you notice? What's happened here? And basically, uh, you're looking for some fundamental messages that will probably arise out of the group of, uh, it was frustrating. Uh, I didn't understand what other people were doing. Um, and there's somehow we need to find a, a, you know, there needed to be some common communication. And you can talk about the importance of trying to find basic common rules. Um, this is one kind of exploration that's found, found throughout the entire curriculum. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, an example. Uh, this is aid on the battlefield. Um, uh, another thing that occurs in all five of the modules is there's often a number of different selected readings. Uh, in the humanitarian perspective module, this is um, one of the modules. Um, the basic story of uh, Henri Dunant and the Battle of Solferino. Um, these are small guided stories. Uh, there's a, another one about um, um, Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, there's a, a, a one about the um, uh, a courageous shopkeeper. In all of the stories, basically there's somebody who's in a situation where they need aid or they're they're up against um, some sort of conflict or confrontation. Uh, and there's a choice to be made by people who are seeing uh, the person who's in need of help. And what are the dynamics that, that lead those people to make a decision to be a helper, to go from being a bystander um, to becoming an upstander? Um, and then it's important also the dynamics of exploring with any group is like, well, what are the pressures on people to be bystanders? Why is it that, um, um, I don't know, in my age, in my day, there was the tremendous Kitty Genovese story where a young woman was murdered in New York and hundreds of people were walking, watching out their windows and, and nobody did basically anything. What are, the, what are the forces that cause bystanders to continue to be bystanders? Uh, and then moving us into the upstanding, hopefully some, some people decide to become upstanders and, and help out in a situation. Certainly that's what Dunant did when faced in the Battle of Solferino. And he realized that uh, persons who were wounded from the battle are no longer in the battle. Uh, and that all men, either on both sides of the battle, um, require aid and assistance. Tutti fratelli, for those of you who are IHL instructors, uh, the basic concept. We can look at another kind of methodology that's used in this curriculum. Next slide. Oh, those are the, those are, here's example. Uh, well, those were example discussion questions that you could ask about the various stories. And the stories, by the way, are found in every one of the five modules. This uh, is a suggested exercise called a mind map. Some of you will probably know it as a chain of consequences uh, exercise. Uh, I've seen this done a number of different ways. Um, um, uh, one kind of way um, has to do with um, setting up a story about um, a, pl a platoon of soldiers 
who have overtaken a hill uh, and there are there are three uh, wounded combatants um, and um, one of the, com you know, you have to make a choice. Will you help these combatants, uh, not in the, who are now non-combatants, uh, or not? Um, and then, what are the repercussions of that action of of, of bystanding or moving to upstanding? Um, what happens when um, we engage in a humanitarian act, and what are the consequences? Next concept. Again, the humanitarian um, perspective is about introducing these basic concepts. Number one is human dignity. Um, IHL instructors out there, you know that dignity is not defined in the Geneva Conventions. Uh, uh, it, that's, it's kind of an interesting thing. The whole, the whole purpose of law sometimes is to help us find those social constructs that can guide us through uh, situations of fairness or unfairness of right or wrong. Um, and clearly one of the most important aspects of the humanitarian perspective is the idea of um, defining, you know, that everyone deserves basic dignity. And here we've, we've got a situation that, um, that you know, we're using the definition here, human dignity can be defined as the respect one retains for oneself. I, I tend to be a, a fan of the Martin's Clause and I, I, I enjoy the idea that uh, human dignity should be a more elaborate concept uh, than even this. Next concept, again, I've sort of beaten the bush on this one. This is really the whole idea about the bystander upstander. Uh, I find that kids, middle school kids and freshman high schoolers really kind of get hot and passionate about struggling with this issue. Um, and you, you, those of, you know, there's no easy, again, there's no easy answers on some of these situations, um, but allowing uh, kids to be able to explore uh, what their basic feeling is, why they're feeling it, um, and then look at how other people say about it uh, helps to develop a critical framework around their values clarification. The idea of social pressure is, uh, again, oh, next slide. What are the influences that are exerted by people upon people um, to make a choice to be helpful with someone else um, or, or not? Um, there's a, uh, you know, particularly uh, middle schoolers and, and high schoolers are all very much struggling with developing sense of identity and you know how do I determine that identity? What crowds do I hang with? What groups do I belong to? Um, um, usually, my experience about um, adolescence is is that everybody's in a gang. Sometimes they're in more than one gang, um, and they have to kind of struggle with the influences they get from one gang to another. Um, our hope is that people uh, that Kids will identify through the various stories and or explorations throughout this curriculum. Um, what is, where are they getting their values from to make a decision um, to be helpful or not? Um, and what are the, what are the effects of, of being the person alone who makes a decision that appears to be contrary to the rest of the group? Dilemma. There are no easy answers. And, you know, I, I'm always a fan of the interesting opening of von Clausewitz's On War, or Von Krieg, um, where he begins by sort of saying that the idea of trying to use international law to 
um, moderate <clears throat> or limit the effects of armed conflict is 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 uh, is uh, and is smoke followed by more smoke followed by some more smoke and he he has uses the first two or three pages of on on war to basically say that international law is is a is is a useless instrument uh, when uh, armed conflict is just in, is is politics by other means, and then he goes on for about 400 pages to talk about how the army that's the most disciplined, that has the highest values, is the army that ultimately will probably be the most effective in terms of uh, carrying out its military purposes. Um, certainly, we all know that armed conflict is filled with areas of gray and confusion. And um, you will, every, everyone is faced throughout um, situations of, um, of trying to understand war um, with the various dilemmas that are posed um, by the act of combat and, and the confusion of, of the scene. Um, there are a number of dilemmas um, that are poised uh, and posited throughout the curriculum. And then again, various different methodologies, small groups, writings, journals, um, charting um, are used to get students to sort of explore with themselves, well, what are both, if not three or four, so I like to talk about multi-lemmas. Um, it's not just a two-sided dilemma, um, but what, what do we do when faced with dilemmas and what are the kinds of thought processes that we can use to try to explain um, the, the moral rules of the road for us to be able to work out a dilemma or the dilemma that is fate we face. And then finally, the humanitarian act. Here, we've got a basic definition. A humanitarian act is one carried out to protect someone whose life or human dignity is in danger, especially someone with whom one would not orderly, ordinarily be inclined to help protect. Such acts might involve personal or material risk. Um, probably for me, the foundation of humanitarian acts um, uh, has its origins in the development of empathy, and it may be guided by various values, principles, that one's other environment uh, brings to bear. Um, but clearly we're looking at, um, as you know, the foundation of the international humanitarian law is uh, how do we protect the most vulnerable? Um, I, I, ha I had a wonderful, <laughs> I had a wonderful uh, experience about 20 years ago when I went to the Warsaw Summer School um, of the ICRC in Poland, and I was surrounded by uh, 50 brilliant young lawyers who were all there as a summer school studying the, the, the conventions. And um, just about every day when we went through various exercises, the, the young lawyers were struggling to find the various rules and bright lines of law that could uh, be used to develop culpability uh, of someone who has probably acted in an illegal framework. Uh, and I, not coming from that big old vision, always kept coming back to, I guess, my social work roots. And I kept saying, yes, but how will the law protect the most vulnerable here? How can we reach out and stop people from uh, killing these civilians? Um, and um, that continues to be the basic foundation of this curriculum. Um, and uh, I hope you get the opportunity to look at some of these explorations and modules over the coming nights um, and j just see all the fun stuff that there is to do with it. So uh, I can tell that Thea is hiding behind a red cross and she probably would have told me to get off the air hours ago. Um, but let's look at what the takeaways are in this first module, which is humanitarian activity. 
One is the entire idea of the section of EHL is to demonstrate the need for rules or laws during armed conflict. You know, for me, what's so fascinating, because I come from a human rights background, is that is that the IHL is, is in some ways the ultimate human rights law. It's the lex specialis that has to arise in the terrible gray of armed conflict. Um, when the boundaries start being devolved, devolved out of occupiers and occupied, um, who's responsible and who will rise up to take care of the most vulnerable. Again, the other thing that's happening in this module are these five key concepts, which if I haven't beaten them to death uh, for you, uh, certainly you'll get a chance to beat yourselves with them. Uh, during armed conflict or times of violence, ordinary people can act to protect those that they normally would not be inclined to. Um, certainly, if nothing else, having some knowledge of the law can place someone in a in a situation, if nothing else, to be a witness um, in the aftermath of, of armed conflict. And that witnessing can be incredibly important. And as I think we all agree, any of us who have been touched by the IHL in any way, um, know that there are no uh, right or easy answers. Um, human beings are very messy. Law is an attempt to try to do something about that messiness. Um, right now, it seems to be the best thing that we, we've come up with in our society so far to struggle with these messy questions. Uh, and I hope you'll all enjoy yourselves over the next couple of nights and, uh, um, and pick up an opportunity to look at these modules uh, and get messy yourself. Okay, I better shut up. <laughs> what a spectacular way to lead us into the program though, Ogden. I, I mean, I, I definitely could not have done a better job myself than what you just did. So I appreciate that you come from tons of experience with this program and I really appreciate all the things that you shared with us. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for a while to readjust my setup here and uh, have a little better, uh, better access to questions. One question that I saw that's already been discussed in the chat a little bit that you might be able to speak to as well, Ogden, is whether this curriculum is only for social studies teachers or uh, how it can be used by other disciplines. If you could speak to that a little, maybe come up with some examples. I know our teacher has been uh, put in the chat. Uh, maybe other examples have also been put in the chat. <clears throat> Well, I, I guess the best way to answer the question is, is what's the context of the educational uh, environment? Um, you know, K through 12 education is very much bounded by the various school districts and the state departments of education that have, um, you know, requirements for what needs to be taught in at least at a K through 12 level. Um, our experience in Wisconsin and, and Minnesota has been, well, it, it really works well for people who are teaching social studies uh, or sociology. Certainly there's applicant, as I noticed that the undergraduate curriculum creeps down slower and more and more into, into K through 12 ed. Uh, you certainly also have now high school psychology classes as well. And the idea of social forces and social pressures modules certainly can fit in here. Um, what was outstanding for me was the idea that when we looked at the NC National Council on Social Studies um, um, requirements, is that this material crosswalked in so many different ways across those requirements. So my first answer is, so yes, it's great for social studies at a K through 12 level. Uh, is it exclusive? Uh, no, is anybody still teaching civics out there? That's a, that would be a great, another place. Uh, is, is anybody uh, teaching psychology or sociology? It would be another great place. Um, there, are, there are explorations here that actually lend themselves also to mathematics. Um, um, there's a great, oh, I've seen this done a number of times. Um, 
um, Mark used to uh, have his students. Um, he he would he would start off with uh, you you're you're in, you have to plan a refugee camp, uh, and you have to so it used the GIS. It used mapping skills. Uh, you had to use mathematics. People had to go explore such questions as uh, uh, how much food will you need? And then of course, how much food will the food cost? I mean, you can, t and when people get it, when kids get it, they just go nuts with it. I, I have in a closet here somewhere about 50 refugee camp maps that are all different, um, but they're all basically got the same perspective. At the undergraduate level, this clearly lends itself to international studies. It lends itself to political science. Uh, it lends itself to, well, I've taught it in three different social work uh, classes. It, it lends itself to human rights education. Um, uh, and I, yeah, and so and, and it lends itself to any sort of pre-law environment as well. Um, I think that's my answer to your question. It, is it? It can be the modules can be really sliced and diced. If if you read if you read the modules and you think about an exercise that sort of grabs you, you'll probably find a way to put it into some kind of class that you're involved with in teaching. Uh, IHL instructors. I don't want to say this because goodness knows you have to teach the IHL the way you're supposed to teach the IHL. But yeah, you could probably put some EHL into IHL and make it more fun. <laughs> uh, you heard it here first. Now, um, thank you so much for that, Ogden. And I know that there were some other questions about other things that I think have been answered in the chat. And I also want to mention that I received a sort of diagram, I think, from Roberta on how th this can be integrated into multiple different um, types of classes. And I'll drop that in the chat after I finish. Um, but uh, let me get back to sharing and see if I can get it the way that I want to so I can actually see what's going on here at the same time. Um, let's see. And then let's try to do this. Okay, here we go. Okay, so briefly about me before I go into my part. This is me in Iraq uh, teaching the Iraqi border guard patrols that were at the time um, manning guard posts where ISIS was trying to infiltrate. Um, I was teaching as an assistant IHL teacher uh, for them with along with our legal advisor. Um, I spent 10 years in the Norwegian military before I came to the U.S. for law school uh, and before I joined the American Red Cross. So I have most of my background in IHL is from operating as a military officer and also teaching my um, soldiers, which were typically, you know, 18 to 19 years old. So not too far uh, in terms of the uh, maturity level and the questions that they had and the approach that they had uh, in many respects to uh, what you expect, obviously at the undergraduate level, but also a little uh, younger than that. And then in this context where I was a mentor and a teacher to other forces, it was a little bit of a different approach, but I'll go into how I think uh, it's somewhat similar for one of the exercises because really what it is, is you have to try to relate the concepts to something that's already familiar. If you're trying to make this into some big Greek, Latin, all the things that lawyers like to do and uh, make it really complicated, right? That's not going to work. It's just going to, you know, the eyes are going to glaze over and they're not going to get anywhere. So what I focused on when I was teaching, um, both my soldiers and these border guard patrols were to try to connect with something that was familiar, either uh, if, if it were religious concepts um, or if it was um, normal day to day situations that can be extrapolated. Uh, that's what we uh, try to do. What you see me here doing is just sitting on the ground, basically in discussion groups. And what we would do is we would basically throw out scenarios and go over how we could deal with them and then go over the rules after to sort of try to illustrate them. And, and that's very similar to really what a EHL is trying to do too. Like you're giving 
you're given a situation and then you're trying to figure out what what uh, ethically, practically, and then legally, maybe, you know, how you would approach it, how to systematize it. So um, I bring that into this um, class and hopefully uh, I'll be able to share some of the same types of knowledge. So we, we're now jumping over to section two uh the the second of the 40 of the 545 uh, minute modules uh, that we have for our mini ehl the objective here is to understand why the rules are needed so you've had all of the things Ogden have gone through with icebreakers sort of trying to understand the landscape the principles uh underlying it uh, and now we're trying to move them into understanding the basic concepts of how IHL, IHL is designed. It's going to be really hard to see to see EHL and IHL back and forth throughout this whole class. I can I can tell already. Um, and then the second objective is to understand the principles and rules of IHL. And, and here I could have repeated the the five key concepts that Ogden also mentioned, but you just heard them. Uh, so I will skip that, but we'll come back and repeat them for the next module. So the first exercise um, that we have, and let me just move you over here because you're in front of my notes. Um, so the first sort of um, exercise that's suggested for this module is a, a discussion uh, around 10 minute discussion where the purpose is to sort of figure out what participants are um, thinking, what they know about this before you dive into uh, the rules. And this is a type of discussion where you're not expecting much. You, you're just trying to figure out where uh, the lay of the land is. You're not expecting people to be well informed. Um, and you know, if people don't have anything to share, they don't have anything to share. This is sort of just where <clears throat> you begin. Typical um, discussion questions can be uh, similar to this. So what is uh, war? How do you define it? Is there um, key characteristics? Uh, what do people know? What images come to mind? Is there a difference between war and armed conflict? Are they the same? Uh, what armed conflicts are going on that people know about? What what armed conflicts or wars have gone on in the past that they're familiar with? Can they tease out some of the uh, things that they know about that? Um, and then the question, is it important to have rules in times of war? And then I, I would probably also add a, a why is it important to have rules in times of war to just have a loose conversation around that. Um, and then finally, um, as Ogden was also touching on, how are people's lives and human dignity affected in times of war to have them reflect around that? And um, the way it's suggested in the course pack is just to have this as a, a class discussion, I think, because it's short and it's sort of um, brief and um, high level that it lends itself uh, well. We can discuss the merits of that uh, after I go through uh, my section if we want to, but I think it lends itself well to just a classroom discussion. Um, the definitions of armed conflict you see here, um, just as sort of a summary to, to answer maybe some of the questions that you have decided. Not all the questions can be answered and they're not supposed to, but um, here uh, are two of the sort of main definitions that would be good for them to know moving forward. Uh, the definitions of armed conflict. So the way we do it in IHL is we um, separate between two different definitions of armed conflict, the international armed conflict and then the non-international armed conflict, uh, where international con armed conflict is uh, prolonged fighting between two or more uh, countries or states, and then non-international armed conflict is the prolonged fighting between a country's armed forces, a state, and uh, an armed group, or between armed groups within a territory or over multiple um, territories. The next exercise um, is what is called the blindfolded captive. So here we have a little bit more of a, an in-depth exercise where um, 
it's recommended that you divide them into small groups um, to discuss this photo. Um, so discussion questions here in the small groups uh, are meant to guide the students to think about how this feels and how it would relate to them if they knew this person or if, uh, you know. So the questions are, what might the captive be thinking? Uh, what, are, what, are, what are the guards thinking? Sort of try to put them in the place of this situation, which might be foreign to, uh, to a lot of them. And then there's this um, two part question or two questions that can be asked for them to, to gain different perspectives, um, which is the first one is, imagine that the captive is your brother, how would you then want the captive to be treated and why? Um, for them to uh, understand what they would want for, for people that they care about. And then the next question is, Imagine that the captive killed your brother during armed conflict. How would you want them to be treated? To, to illustrate how feelings also play into this and how the principles of international armed, uh, of it, international humanitarian law, which they will go into later, is meant to be universal. They're meant to be a standard that you keep for everyone whether they are someone you love or someone that hurt the people you love. And so this is sort of leading them into that way of understanding how that might um, be affected and why universal principles like that uh, are important. Uh, and then you uh, reconvene the class after they've been in these small groups uh, to discuss the following questions. Now they've had some time to think about the situation, put themselves in the shoes of people involved, people uh, related to uh, people involved, et cetera. And um, then it's meant to be more of a... Um, eagle's eye uh, discussion where you talk in general about how a prisoner of war should be treated now that you've had the perspective of going through how would you want someone that you care about to be treated how would you want someone that hurt someone you cared about to be treated how should we in general treat a prisoner of war as sort of the next part of that thinking right and then um some more Detailed questions, should a prisoner's possession of important information germane to the armed conflict affect how the prisoner is treated, or in what ways the prisoner's human dignity um, at risk is classic um, questions to be inputted there. The final exercise I wanted to go over with you is this photo collage, and I thought we would try a couple of the photos and see um what 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 answers uh you all come up with uh, just to illustrate how this exercise would work so this um exercise it starts out as a small group exercise where you have this photo collage here of multiple different scenes from armed conflict you um split uh, the students up into small groups and each uh group gets one of the photos uh, to discuss, and their task is to come up with a rule or rules that they think might be needed to prevent or mitigate the negative aspects of that photo. Um, and then they wrote, write those things down, and then they reconvene afterwards to share those things. Here is a um, bigger blow up of this collage, just so you can see what um, we are working with. I have chosen a couple of photos for you to uh, come up with some answers to in the chat. I'm going to share the first one now. Here you have photo 3A. Um, whatever you believe that the negative aspects of this photo is, I want you to put in the chat uh, what rules you think would help prevent or mitigate whatever those negative effects are. Because I think that also would give you um, some ideas of how to how to use this information too and how to work um how to moderate a a, a discussion 
So let me see. I hopefully I can see the chat while I also see your. Mm -hmm. I have one saying rules protecting people's homes from destruction. I think it appears from the photo that these people uh, are uh, fleeing from their homes. They appear to be carrying their belongings with them. Uh, one suggests all efforts should be exhausted to limit destruction of civilian property. So within the same realm of protection of civilian property, uh, another one, uh, rules for provision of basic needs, shelter, food, medical care. Uh, I think we can also see some of them carrying food. So providing uh, food for civilians would also help mitigate. Uh, rules protecting, okay, it's moving really fast. Uh, rules protecting civilians from deportations and being used as hostages. Maybe they're being deported. We don't know why they're walking, right? That could be the reason. Um, they're fleeing from their homes because of armed conflict, protect homes of civilians, refugees, civilians should be protected. I think the, the running thread here is protection of civilians, um, right? Which I think is a fundamental part of IHL. So we're really on uh, a good track. Um, protect people like these from being targeted, even though there appears to be at least one soldier next to the column. That's a really interesting uh, observation. They're, they seem to be under watch by someone um, holding um, a weapon and appearing in camouflage uniform. Um, they need protections as they leave uh, areas and head to safer ground. Uh, they can be victimized along the way. Uh, or at the new site. I think that is an important point. Children carrying heavy items. Um, is there food available, health care? Um, controlled by the military. Uh, special protection to women and children need to be considered. That's a really good point. That seems like it comes from someone who knows a little bit about IHL. There are special protections for women and children in IHL and had a student brought that out, I think that would be a great um, nugget to bring into the discussion. So, you know, try to find the running thread between all of the different um, suggestions. And then also, if there are small nuggets like that, try to bring them out. I am going to go to the next photo um, and give you a little bit less time because I feel like this photo less is going on. And um, it's a little bit maybe um, more limited to what uh, you would suggest. Maybe, I don't know. Um, I think it ties into some of the things you said before about special protection to children. Um, there was something earlier about uh, protecting children from human trafficking, which this isn't necessarily human trafficking, but it definitely is a child. Um, it's um, identified in the chat as a child soldier. It appear, appears to be a child so soldier. Um, there should be rules against child soldiering. Um, and then there's another question sort of uh, challenging that. Is he protecting his family or is he a child soldier? Uh, regardless, there needs to be rules against child soldiers. Um, Multiple other people agree with this take. I think um, this is a theme that you see throughout the EHL pack too, is this idea of child soldiers because it is something that um, is, is easy to connect to when you're um, a young person yourself and you know uh, sort of your own limitations and vulnerabilities to see someone your own age or younger in this position, I think will um, will be something that can um, engage a lot of students in, in discussions. Um, and I see that we just shared the photo collage resource, so that's good. Um, then after having 
let me just close the chat. After having had these small groups, um, you can reconvene the class, have people share uh, what their individual um, suggestions were, and um, also potentially take it a, a step further um, to say, to talk about how these rules, if they were implemented, how would they change the experience of war in that photo or in war in general? And then on the flip side, how, um, if they were to be implemented, what might be difficult in implementing them? Are, is, is this realistic, um, et cetera? Then um, the next part of the section starts to go into what the rules uh, are, starting with what the purpose of IHL is, uh, which I have on the slide for you here. It's a body of international rules that seek to limit suffering during armed conflict. That's the basic concept, right? And it does this by trying to regulate as far as it's practicable, the conduct of fighting, uh, in particular, by setting limits on methods and means of warfare, meaning what types of weapons can you use, how can how are you able to do it, who are you able to target, etc. And then also, particularly trying to protect people who are no longer taking part in hostilities, um, wounded, sick, shipwrecked, prisoners of war, others detained, um, and also protecting people through methods and means that are that are not a part of the fighting at all, the civilians with special protections for the most vulnerable, um, children. Um, and um, that is sort of the fundamental underlying thing um, that would, um, that, that, that they'll see again in the rules and they'll understand why the rules were made the way that they are based on this purpose. Um, that concludes my part of it. So I just wanted to take a brief pause and see if there were any questions or anything you wanted to add, Ogden, to what I've gone through. Obviously, I've never implemented these exercises because I am not a educator uh, of EHL, but I, uh, especially the um, the captive is some uh, an exercise that I used with the border guard patrols because they. Um, they actually asked some of these questions. Um, they, I remember one of them um, started one of our um, sessions with, well, ISIS killed um, a lot of members of my family. Why, sh why shouldn't I treat them the same way? Um, where we, we had a similar thing where we, we did the, the thought exercise of, you know, what if there were universal rules um, if, if you were to, if you wanted to choose between everyone being treated the way that your family members were treated or everyone being treated as you would treat a loved one and sort of going down some of the same thought experiments, um, that the blindfolded captive, um, exercise has. And I think, um, I think a lot of them sort of, agreed with the perspective that um that this is uh the the whole the whole two wrongs don't make one right concept right that we want these rules to be universal and if we want these rules to be universal we all have to try to abide by them and so um that is i think the closest i have to implementing one of these exercises um what did you want to add, Ogden? I saw that you were. Well, I, I, I guess one of the things that, can you hear me? I just want to. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, I, I'm sensitive to, um, I, I, I fundamentally uh, believe that people go from being bystanders to upstanders when they have an opportunity to uh, do that chain of consequences kind of thinking with themselves about the situation in front of them and where their values come from and what needs to be applied. Uh, that being said, I think it's important to really be sensitive to uh, the modern era, which is clearly a, a global environment. Um, I have been in classrooms 
where a quarter of the students are refugees. Um, I have been in classrooms where um, one half of uh, the audience is either in the military or has a military member uh, in their family. Uh, I have been in classrooms where um, students have been uh, victims of armed conflict. Uh, I've uh, I saw in the chat somebody asking about are there are there forms to send home for permission. Um, to my knowledge, there aren't any forms, but I clearly would um, um, take the spirit of that question and and enter into using EHL with with the reality that we're not talking about going and getting ice cream. Um, we're talking about really. Uh, potentially serious and trauma triggering events. Um, so it's pretty much been my practice, at least at the undergraduate level, to let folks know where we're going over the next couple of modules or the next couple of experiences uh, and giving them the opportunity uh, to opt out uh, at, at any point in time uh, or opt out ahead of the, of the game. Um, um, so I guess that, that's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, there's, this stuff is exciting. Um, and I, I started off sort of highlighting that. Uh, but that being said, um, anybody who's going to facilitate uh, the material out of the DHL needs to realize that if you buy the ticket, you're going to have to take the ride, that uh, it can go into very it can go into places where um, there are no easy answers. And sometimes we really just have to kind of acknowledge with ourselves that, well, I certainly don't have the answer to this question. How might we find an answer to this question and then go from there? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's really important. And I think, you know, I was in that situation uh, when when teaching this in Iraq too, where most people I was teaching to had been affected one way or the other or had to deal with it. And uh, you you definitely ask some questions that you cannot answer and that you cannot sort of put yourself in the shoes of the person asking. And I would say, um, as I mentioned before, I think, you know, connecting it to something that they're familiar with, connecting them to a, a set of values um, that they're familiar with as, as guiding principles is sort of the most uh, that you can do. And then uh, just adding that perspective to the conversation. Um, it does take some maturity from the instructor um, to, to do that. And I think uh, some of these small group exercises also, you have to have that in mind when you, um, when you implement them that you you need to have someone with that uh, bandwidth to guide all these small groups and they shouldn't be just sent off alone somewhere to to do whatever i think uh, especially for for these exercises that i just uh, went over in that same in that same vein um let me see if we have any questions in the chat uh thomas is going over the form question um, what about school councils to help uh, during the class? Counselors. Good idea. Okay. You already answered that in the chat. Okay, that's good. Um, okay. I don't see any other questions for me or for you. So I'm going to go over to the next and final part of our session, which Thomas is going to take over. Uh, from Christian, who couldn't be here today, uh, which is the history and basic rules of IHL. Hey, thanks, Tan. And um, let's see here. So I'm not Christian Jorgensen. Christian is our IHL legal advisor and uh, one of my colleagues here on the team. He couldn't be here tonight um, uh, due to some other commitments, but uh, I'm the senior legal advisor for the IHL program, as I mentioned off the top. Like Taya, I also have a, a background in uniform with these rules. Uh, I still am, on, at least in the Army Reserve, a uh, Army judge advocate, so an Army lawyer. I was on active duty in the Army as a JAG officer for 
uh, more than seven years before I transitioned back into the reserves. And uh, I, while I didn't go to Iraq, I did practice IHL in Afghanistan as uh, what we call an operational law attorney. So I was advising on these rules during combat operations, uh, real time, uh, this is um, Operation Enduring Freedom before we handed off those operations to, um, uh, to the Afghan military. And I'll be speaking more on that and, and sort of the military aspect and what that looks like from, uh, you know, in the field, uh, so to speak, next week. So if you come next week, I've got a whole special presentation on that. Um, Taya mentioned a really good point, and Ogden did as well, which is the business of relating these rules. Uh, things like IHL, things like warfare are really foreign concepts. Uh, students may have a basis or, or generally under, a general understanding of the rule of law and the importance of laws in society. Um, certainly, students are exposed through pop culture, video games, movies, TV, et cetera, to concepts of war, to concepts of war crimes, uh, you know, in, in as we sit here today, we're more than a year into the Ukraine war. And uh, there, you know, if you open your, your uh, newspaper, if that's a thing in most places these days, or, or if you uh, peruse the headlines, you, you can't get far without seeing IHL stories about that conflict and others. So these things are coming across students' uh, phones, uh, their faces, they're, uh, they're coming up in conversations all the time, uh, they're exposed to this sort of thing. And, and this process, uh, and, and EHL in particular, helps them to get their arms around it, to better understand it, and to take it from this uh, nebulous thing that is difficult to understand, difficult to access in some ways, and, and can lead to a feeling of helplessness. You're, say, a high school sophomore or junior, you see these things happening on the news, and you just don't know how to help, like how to make a difference. And learning about them, getting educated about them is a key component in that. But when it comes to, to relating these concepts to, to students, to, to folks in general with, uh, with no legal background or no military background, that's not an impossible task. And I use American football as, as a great example of that. Certainly you can take movies and TV shows and sort of relate examples there as well. But football is a great example. So violent American sport, right? People are hitting each other, trying to dislodge the ball, trying to move a ball downfield and, and score. And, uh, you know, another set of humans are, are coming in and trying to bash them and stop them from doing that, uh, often with a, a high degree of physical force. There are a set of rules for football. Football hasn't always had the rules that it has today. It used to be, you know, mostly unchecked uh, game. There maybe were a few basic rules, but people weren't wearing helmets. They weren't wearing pads. Uh, it, it was uh, sort of like the total war concept of, of uh, warfare in, in millennia past where anything went. But over time, due to concerns around the sport, player safety, et cetera, uh, football developed rules. And we accept those rules as the game is played. We accept them that they are necessary uh, to reduce the destructive effects of that sport. Very different than warfare, obviously, but the, the basic concept there that you can take something that is inherent uh, in, in one regard, inherently violent, and apply a set of rules to try to not remove the violence altogether or prevent it, but to rein in the, the sort of destructive effects, the needless injuries, uh, et cetera, early retirements, concussions, um, that should be pretty familiar to students and, and connecting in some of those uh, different ways um, is, is a way to get that light bulb to turn on. So let's take a brief tour through the history of IHL. And I, I, I'm just going to hit wave tops here. You don't need to become a historical scholar on this type of law, but it's important to reflect on the fact that the starting point for these rules isn't, uh, say, the, the uh, BC times or 100 AD. Certainly there were concepts and, and certain aspects of warfare that began to, to uh, take shape that looked sort of like modern day rules. Uh, concepts like chivalry during armed conflict, prisoner transfers, uh, treatment of, of certain individuals under uh, during times of armed conflict. But by and large, the business of warfare was pretty, pretty well unchecked. I, I mentioned that concept of total war. 
this business where anything goes to get the victory. Uh, things like civilians, civilian objects, those are means to an end. And often those were, uh, those became perfectly valid and acceptable targets during armed conflict to reach uh, the ultimate conclusion, to achieve your objective, to, to uh, get the enemy to submit. Um, and at our starting point there on the left side of your screen, the, the sea really started to change uh, about 1859 on a battlefield in Northern Italy, a place called Solferino, a small village, but uh, Napoleon's forces were coming up against another army in a large battle um, that, that centered within uh, one of the Italian wars for independence, two big, big armies on the field. And there was a businessman in town, a, a man by the name of Henri Dunant. Do not, Mr. Do not was not there for the battle. In fact, he was there to execute a business deal. He had acquired some uh, water rights, but not rights to the land that the water sat under. So make your judgments about his business acumen. But he thought that he could land the deal, close the deal, uh, and, and, and move on by going to the holder of those, those rights, to, to going to Napoleon himself. So he knew Napoleon would be there with his army. And his bright idea was to, to uh, present this deal and be on his way. What happened uh, was that the Battle of Solferino broke out and Mr. Dunant found himself surrounded by the destruction of that battle. Uh, by noon that day, uh, tens of thousands of uh, soldiers from both sides uh, lay wounded or dead on the battlefield. During that period of time, that doesn't seem like it's ancient history, 1859, but we didn't have things like medical evacuation of the battlefield. There were no uh, uh, battlefield ambulances, uh, horse-drawn or otherwise. If you fell on the field of battle, and you were injured, you had to hope that you survived until the battle was over and the smoke cleared and hope that somebody came along to help you. Well, Mr. Dunant ended up doing just that. He joined with a number of, of uh, civilians in the town, uh, nuns and whatnot, and they proceeded to stay up uh, night after night after night, uh, several days in a row, tending to those wounded uh, uh, in and around the battlefield. Uh, and, and that experience, the, the business of seeing that unchecked uh, suffering there in Solferino really made a profound impact on Mr. Dunant. He went home to Switzerland and wrote a book, a small book called uh, Memory of Solferino. And for whatever the equivalent of going viral is in, in 1859 terms, the book went viral. It was his attempt to, to quite literally disseminate uh, his experiences there uh, in Solferino to the world. And the book was as much a reflection on that, uh, that suffering as it was a call to action that Europe and, and the world come together and address this issue that while we may not end war, uh, that may be outside of our grasp, it can't be the fact that, uh, it can't be the case that there are no rules to rein in that destruction. Uh, he, he saw that, uh, that, that lack of humanity on the battlefield and saw that there could be a change. And so uh, that led uh, Mr. Dunant to, to found what was then uh, known as the International Red Cross, uh, today, that's known as the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, which is the, uh, the arm of, of the Red Cross movement based out of Geneva. And this led uh, the march toward the first Geneva Convention, uh, which was, yes, uh, thank you, Holly. That, that book is available on uh, the ICRC website. It's a free download. Uh, I, it's a highly recommended uh, bit of reading uh, there, so, and, and a really historic bit of reading. So in 1864, the first Geneva Convention was ratified. Uh, the, the first Geneva Convention uh, concerned the sort of things that do not saw in the field of battle in Solferino, namely the, uh, the, the business of caring for the sick and the wounded uh, who, who fell during battle. Uh, the, in line with the, the adoption of this first Geneva Convention, you had the ICRC officially stand up. It, it, uh, came into being as a neutral organization, an international organization that was recognized by other countries. And as a key point, it came into being as an entity that was able and permitted to enter conflict zones and care for the wounded. So to, to achieve the exact sort of thing that Mr. Dunant uh, sought to do as he left Solferino. 
there in uh, 1864, t- only 12 European countries ratified uh, that first Geneva Convention. The United States was not among those. And uh, that was because we were in the middle of the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865. But across the Atlantic in that war, a, uh, another sort of provision, not an international treaty, but another uh, precursor to IHL came into being about at the same time. And this was known as the Lieber Code. So it's named after a man named Francis Lieber. And he developed this, uh, this set of rules, this code, at the behest of President Lincoln. President Lincoln uh, brought it into order uh, in 1864 via executive order. Uh, He signed it and what the Lieber Code did was it set down a set of rules governing the conduct of the Union armed forces out in the field. So concepts like treatment of civilians, treatment of civilian infrastructure, prisoners taken during war, uh, deserters, retributions, these things were all really novel concepts uh, outside of uh, the, the, Geneva, the first Geneva Convention's protection of the sick and wounded. This sort of thing didn't exist. We didn't have this sort of code in the U.S. military, and it was unique in, in terms of world militaries at the time. It was really revolutionary, uh, but it provided that first, first sort of American structure uh, that would, would sort of meet uh, its counterparts in Geneva, or its counterpart in Geneva, and lead to to, uh, the eventual blossoming of IHL. Now, again and again on this timeline, and if you look into the the history of this, what you're gonna see is conflict occurs and then IHL develops further. Rarely has IHL been on the leading edge, uh, solving some problem before we we realize it fully exists or anticipating a gap in its own law and, and working to fill that. What has happened is that experiences learned out of armed conflict, oftentimes at the, uh, at the expense of, of individuals or uh, property, that sort of thing, uh, have led to further developments in IHL. And so if you fast forward there to, to uh, right, right before that first dot or that third dot on the timeline there in World War I, in 1899 and 1907, so just before the outbreak of, of World War I, you had what's known as the Hague uh, Conventions that, that uh, came into being. Hague is a, a combination of three treaties and three declarations. Amongst that, and I, I should say that Hague is still considered good law today, so it's, it's had a really enduring effect. But uh, Hague exists to, to help govern how wars were fought. So we, we call that the means of uh, armed conflict. So the business of, of how the fighting is done on the field. So it, it addressed uh, some overlapping things with both, both the First Geneva Convention and the Libra Code. So treatment of the wounded on the battlefield, prisoners of war. It implemented rules regarding uh, the targeting of civilians. It brought about uh, new rules concerning occupation. So when an, uh, an armed force takes control of an area of, of uh, land in, in uh, enemy territory, uh, what do those rules look like? So the Hague Convention really brought uh, and, and established uh, a, a more robust framework that, that really brought together aspects of both Lieber and the first Geneva Convention. World War I happens, the war to end all wars, and out of the horrors that that, uh, that, that war uh, bestowed on the world, you had two big uh, movements in, in IHL. The first you see there is the 1929 Uh, convention on treatment of the prisoners of war. Uh, What this GC recognized was that uh, the the business and and the provisions of Hague that surrounded the treatment of prisoners of war left a lot to be desired. Uh, POWs during World War I on both sides of the conflict experienced some really horrendous treatment. Uh, That was recognized by the world powers and it ultimately led to to this GC and it really tried to, to implement a more more robust set of protections that span from the moment someone is captured to the moment that they should be released. It encompassed things like how, uh, you know, how POWs should be punished for transgressions. Uh, It was very, very robust compared to to, uh, what was in Hague. You also had uh, in 1925, so just four years before, uh, the Geneva Protocol on asphyxiating poisonous and other gases. So if there's one image that probably comes to mind apart from trench warfare in World War I. It's probably the use of 
uh, awful chemical weapons like mustard gas uh, and the like. Uh, that, that 1925 uh, protocol banned those weapons. So this is an instance where we're, we're looking, the world is looking at a certain means of warfare, that, that, uh, that chemical weaponry, and saying that the, uh, the suffering that, 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 that those weapons cause, that superfluous injury is unacceptable. Uh, and you're going to see some, some uh, further iterations of that as history marches forward. World War II breaks out uh, in 1939, uh, the U.S. gets involved uh, shortly thereafter, uh, following Pearl Harbor and after the end of the war uh, and the completion of the Nuremberg trials, so the, the uh, bit of justice for uh, war criminals during that, uh, during that war, as well as the Tokyo trials for crimes committed in the Pacific, you had the world come together and, and give what is uh, really a, a, a modern foundational set of IHL. So the 1949 Geneva Conventions, it's actually four conventions, GC 1, 2, 3, and 4. This is a, a really comprehensive suite of IHL protections that brought uh, IHL as a, a body of law up to sort of modern times. It, it uh, reflected lessons learned in the destruction of World War II, and it really sought to fill major gaps that, that uh, still existed among certain uh, vulnerable groups and, and others on the battlefield. So just a, a quick uh, once around the world, GC1 is a, a gonna be familiar. It, it's uh, protection of the wounded and the sick in the field. So, so soldiers that, that uh, you know, get injured in, in, uh, during conflict, it concerns uh, medical treatment, uh, folks facilitating medical treatment on the battlefield. GC2 is similar, so a similar set of protections, but it applies to uh, those who are sick and shipwrecked at sea, so armed forces at sea. GC3 is your, your suite of protections for POWs. It actually replaced that uh, 1929 Geneva Convention, so GC, GC3 is, is your sole basis for, for POW protections there, your main basis. And then GC4, which is a robust set of protections for civilians. Now, it's important to note that, uh, you know, for all the, the divisions in the world, uh, it, there is a unification when it comes to Geneva. So the Geneva Conventions have sort of the honor of being one of the, the only treaties out there, one of the only sets of treaties that is universally adopted by all nations. As of 1996, um, all nations on the, on the planet, at least those that I'm aware of, have ratified uh, the Geneva Conventions, meaning that they have officially adopted it and agreed to be bound by the rules therein. So that was a really landmark moment. You fast forward just uh, about five years later, you had a, another Hague Convention, this time on the protection of cultural property. So it addressed things uh, movable and immovable, everything from, you know, say a stock standard, a standard uh, stationary religious site to something movable, um, you know, Einstein's notebook or something like that. Um, and uh, it, it uh, I, I should say, hey, that 1954 Hague Convention is not universally ratified. In fact, it took the U.S. about 50 plus years to finally ratify that convention. 1977 uh, marked the last big sea change for the Geneva Conventions. So between 1949 and, and 1977, you had a change in the way war, wars were being fought. I don't mean like the business of soldiers fighting each other. But you went from these uh, large wars between countries to proxy wars, uh, things like uh, like you see in, in Vietnam, where uh, you, you had a, a large scale insurgency um, you know, set aside, uh, you know, any any kind of discussion about the, the uh, sovereignty of North Vietnam. But you had uh, the rise of what we call non-international armed conflicts around the globe, and that exposed yet another set of gaps within IHL. And so you had two additional protocols that were brought online uh, in 1977. Uh, AP1, as we call it for short, deals with a set of protections for international armed conflicts, so country versus country, while AP2 uh, brought online a set of protections for those non-international armed conflicts. Uh, and then you had one additional uh, protocol uh, that came online in the early 2000s and really dealt with uh, recognition of, of um, 
the red crystal uh, symbology, so a protected emblem, but not a major uh, change in IHL. Outside of, of uh, AP 1 and 2, IHL didn't stay uh, stagnant. You still had further uh, regulation of, of more modern means of warfare. Uh, you had uh, the influence of expanding human rights law. So international human rights law is something we'll, we'll learn about uh, later in, in uh, night two. But you had sort of a growing recognition that uh, including the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights and you had some intersectionality there. You also had a, a slate of uh, accountability that was done through a variety of international tribunals, things like uh, the uh, tribunals in Rwanda, those in the form of Yugoslavia, those that are still going on for, for Kosovo, uh, the creation of the International Criminal Court uh, via the Rome Statute in the early 2000s. Uh, so IHL is still developing. There's still, outside of these treaties that we've talked about, there are customs that are practiced. So a body of IHL known as customary international law or CIL. So these are based not on a written treaty that countries have come together and ratified, but instead on repeated state practices. So things that, that happen on the battlefield that, that nations again and again recognize, those uh, become viewed over time as custom, meaning that they uh, countries view that they are bound by the rules, even if they're not uh, contained in, in some treaty that the country has signed on to. So you have had a further development of those customs as, as more uh, wars have been fought. Next slide. The main thrust of, of this portion of the presentation is on the four principles of IHL. And if uh, you're able to impart uh, one thing on your students outside of, of just the general understanding of the importance of uh, this body of law, it would be these four principles. Understanding the, these four uh, core principles will, will give a student, will give an individual a really great understanding of a wide swath of IHL and really provides a, an outstanding foundation to understand a lot of these dilemmas that, uh, that uh, are ongoing in our world. So we'll walk through each of them from necessity, distinction, proportionality, and unnecessary suffering. Next slide. So the first is uh, military necessity. So this is the idea that certain things are going to be needed during armed conflict. IHL isn't a light switch. IHL doesn't uh, operate to prohibit all means of, of innocent death or destruction. IHL instead attempts to balance the scales. So it's a recognition that war is going to be fought and that uh, people will, will unfortunately die or be injured uh, during war. And, and some of that, stems from things that are naturally required uh, to achieve a military objective. What IHL attempts to do is counterbalance uh, that, uh, that sort of military necessity as we'll, we'll dive into with an injection of, of humanity in there. So to limit uh, the destructive effects, to limit that use of force to only what's necessary to achieve uh, that military aim. So the, the thrust of this principle, as you see there, is that we really want uh, that, that uh, armed forces are required or, or those on the battlefield are required to only use military force or military actions to accomplish a legitimate military purpose. Uh, and and uh, I'll get into the last uh, part of that sentence in just a second here. So when we talk about a legitimate military purpose, we mean you're using force, uh, against something that is a valid military target. That can look like a lot of things. What it isn't are civilians or civilian uh, structures, that sort of thing. So necessity uh, really boils down to the idea that uh, if, you, if you are using force, this is what I call a gatekeeping principle. You have to have a, a military necessity, so that legitimate military purpose Otherwise, you don't get to any of the other principles. You don't go any further. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200, as they say, if anybody still plays Monopoly these days. Um, the, the business here is that uh, in, in wars in the past, uh, there was oftentimes a use of force that was unconnected to any military objective. So the raising of a town uh, to terrorize the civilian population that had no connection with uh, any military objective 
that would have no military necessity under the, the ambit of this, uh, of this concept. Importantly, uh, that limit uh, or, or that, that rule is balanced by a set of limits. So you can imagine, uh, you can, uh, there are many people that could probably drive a truck through the term necessity, right? You can meet people that would just say, well, anything's necessary, it's, it's war, right? The, the counterbalance here within this principle is that you can't use necessity to justify actions that are otherwise prohibited under IHL, under, um, under the rules of war. So by that, I mean, you can't say, uh, hey, we just took a bunch of prisoners. Uh, we, we don't have room to, to transport them, so we have to execute them. Killing prisoners uh, like that, executing prisoners is flatly outlawed during IHL. Your concept of military necessity doesn't allow you to override and, and do something illegal. It is not a justification to do anything that you want on the battlefield. So there's no destruction just for destruction's sake. Next slide. So we have here an example, uh, and uh, this concerns World War II and the business of uh, a Nazi high command order that, as you read there, uh, directed their military to execute allied special forces, so commandos. Uh, don't, don't take them prisoner, just kill them. Uh, they tried to use necessity in the aftermath of the war to, to justify this. Uh, among other things, to avoid banditry, you had commandos who were oftentimes inserted behind enemy lines. They were there to disrupt supply lines and cause all manner of chaos to disrupt enemy operations. The Nazis turned that banditry, and uh, th their idea was, uh, you know, why, why take these guys prisoner? Why go through that effort when we can just kill them and execute them? Uh, that was rejected. So that's, uh, that was found to be beyond uh, those limits of IHL and, uh, and it was rejected. Next slide. Uh, the other example before I get into distinction is uh, the, the business of uh, what's known as the Rendelic War, so, or the Rendelic Rule rather. So likewise in World War II, there was a German uh, general who was in command of all Nazi forces in Finland and Norway. Uh, toward the end of the war, uh, Russia or Germany was getting beaten back. Uh, Russia and the Soviet army was uh, was hot on its heels, uh, and the Allies were rapidly advancing on Berlin uh, from the east. Uh, as the German forces were rapidly pulling out of of uh, Finland and Norway, you had General Rendulic uh, adopt a set of scorched earth tactics, and uh, in an incident known as the Lapland War, he ordered. Uh, the destruction of a Finnish town uh, known as Rovaniemi. Uh, My Finnish is non-existent and horrible, but he ordered this town to be raised. And the allegation at Nuremberg was that uh, this was retribution, that this was not allowed. It was not military ne uh, militarily necessary. And uh, he should be held to account for that death and destruction that he caused. Uh, ultimately, he was acquitted of that charge, and what came out of that was uh, the, the uh, component of military necessity that judges a, a military commander or a soldier based on the information that was available to them at the time, as opposed to judging them by hindsight. So Rendulic's defense was that as uh, this was a, a necessary tactic uh, to, to help his forces avoid complete destruction at the hands of the Soviets, and the other allied forces, uh, he, in effect, he tried to hang it on uh, a military need and, and uh, argued that at the time, the circumstances prevailing uh, in the moment, that was his, uh, that was his forces uh, only and best option was to, to adopt those tactics. So the judgment there didn't excuse the actions. It didn't wipe away the suffering that happened, but uh, it, it is a good recognition and a counterbalance to that other example that I gave where uh, IHL doesn't operate to prohibit all death and destruction. And, and uh, there, there are certain aspects of that that, uh, that are unsavory, that are, are difficult to swallow, but that, uh, that, that reflect realities of armed conflict. So distinction is a, a pretty straightforward principle in that a combatant is required to distinguish between a... Uh, a military target and a civilian target or a civilian object. So those that are not participating in hostilities. The idea here is we only wanna apply force towards a valid target, right? 
civilians who are have no role in in hostilities are not a valid target civilian objects that have no connection to hostilities aren't valid military targets and so uh distinction is is that requirement that you use discretion when you're you're using force uh again you see that second bullet which which i've hammered there uh distinction doesn't prevent all collateral damage but what it does prevent is is indiscriminate targeting and it does require you to to analyze and think about uh and weigh your targets we'll get into that in the connection point with the pr principle of proportionality proportionality momentarily um but this is a core protection for civilians and uh civilian objects i would note that in situations where there is doubt so if there's doubt about whether a person is civilian whether an object is a civilian object the presumption is that it's a civilian the presumption is that it's a civilian object until or unless it is demonstrably otherwise so unless uh in the case of an object it has a, a distinct military purpose or a military purpose is discovered uh you have to start with that presumption next slide so yemen is uh, a, a rather tragic modern day example of this students no doubt have have at least tangentially uh, heard about stories come out of, coming out of this conflict this is a non-international armed, armed conflict between uh the uh yemen government <clears throat> and a saudi backed coalition so saudi arabia has its armed forces mainly air assets that have been engaged for a number of years in yemen fighting against an insurgency uh known as the houthis uh the houthi rebellion uh the saudi military has been accused of indiscriminate air strikes against uh in and deliberately targeting civilians and civilian objects things like refugee camps civilian gatherings such as weddings uh medical facilities mosques uh essential civilian infrastructure so all the things that that distinction operates uh to prohibit they've been accused of of doing there uh and and it's generated quite a lot of international outrage as a result they've also been accused of using indiscriminate weapons so means of warfare that are outlawed meaning uh, and, and namely that pertains to their use of cluster munitions um now i i should note that this uh, both the saudi and the yemen government both it, you know purport that uh they're following the law of armed conflict but uh it's it's these sort of allegations that paint sort of a clear bright line in in uh sort of what happens when distinction is not abided by uh the civilians are are uh, left in the crosshairs and they become once again a means to an end and uh, it really leaves destruction and death unchecked there next slide proportionality uh is that uh, that principle that i i mentioned was connected with uh, necessity so proportionality as a principle is uh, a balancing act so it is a a set of scales that you must use before you you apply military force in a situation so even though you you may have military necessity you've uh, gone through the distinction analysis and you say hey i've got a set of military targets here you have to balance the proportionality scales and what those scales uh require that the anticipated death or destruction of civilians or civilian property can't be excessive in relation to the concrete military advantage that's gained by the use of force so there's no finite definition of of how those scales balance there is uh on the 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 military force side of the scale a a recognition that it can't just be theoretical that the advantage that you're going to gain can't be uh theoretical and maybe if if uh these all these links in the chain happen uh down the line some months from now we could gain an advantage it needs to be concrete so hey if we blow up uh this uh this checkpoint this will degrade enemy forces it'll allow uh, our forces to to open up a uh, a lane of travel and and uh resupply our other forces so a concrete uh and and distinct sort of military advantage has to be identified there now excessive can be a lot of things can excessive can be defined and often is defined by those uh that are that are waging the armed conflict i can tell you that that uh, our proportionality scales when i was in afghanistan at the uh, this is circa 2013 uh we we tolerated uh, no civilian casualties that didn't mean that civilian casualties didn't occur but 
uh, if there were situations, if we were considering using force and we were uh, likely to cause a civilian casualty, uh, we oftentimes pulled back and considered other options. So uh, that, that scale is going to be different, but just understand that on one side is, is that anticipated uh, death to, to civilians, so innocents, and on the other side is that military advantage. So you have to go through a proportionality uh, analysis. Next slide. So drone strikes is a good example of uh, where proportionality repeatedly uh, comes into play. And I wanna highlight uh, two, I guess either uh, more recent, one more recent, one very notorious uh, incident. So the first one we'll talk about is, is the uh, mission to, to capture or kill Osama bin Laden, so circa 2011. And uh, as we all know, a special forces raid was executed uh, and that sent a, a number of Navy SEALs in on the ground, uh, inserted by helicopters to go into the compound on foot. Now, I, I would submit to you that a proportionality analysis was done to reach uh, that end result, to reach the decision to, to put people on the ground in harm's way uh, to execute that mission. Uh, something like a drone, so hey, we, we have identified where bin Laden is, uh, we could you know, send in an unmanned drone and, and uh, strike this target. Certainly that may have been an option, uh, but what was known at the time was that there were civilians in that compound. There were women, there were children, uh, they were known to be there. Uh, some might argue that that was intentionally done, that they were co-located there uh, to, to offer some sort of uh, human shielding uh, for uh, bin Laden and his counterparts that were there. Needless to say, I would submit to you that the fact that that operation was executed on foot, at least in part, uh, stemmed from that proportionality analysis, that idea that uh, it, it's going to be difficult to limit or eliminate civilian casualties uh, with another, uh, another option. So uh, that certainly came into play there. Additionally, some of you may have seen uh, last year, last July in 2022 in Kabul, uh, bin Laden's top lieutenant and, and the individual that took over the, the uh, al-Qaeda uh, following his death, a, a man by the name of al-Zawari, al was killed on a balcony in, in Kabul. And he was killed by a sort of a, a specialized weapon that didn't explode. It had no warhead. Uh, and uh, I would submit to you that that's another good example of proportionality in action. Certainly, uh, you know, with a, a person of his sort of value militarily, taking him out, he's the operational head of Al Qaeda. He's a, been a big target for for a number of years. You could say, hey, we, we could justify a lot of civilian casualties to get this one guy. That wasn't done. The scales were balanced differently, and we chose to use, uh, a, or the U.S. chose to use a different munition to to carry out that mission. And again, uh, that probably almost certainly had uh, that proportionality analysis connected to it. Next slide. So the last principle we'll talk today is the uh, prohibition on un unnecessary suffering. The basic rule is, is pretty easy to understand. We don't want either means or methods of warfare that are either calculated or used to cause unnecessary suffering or superfluous injury. Basically, we don't want to injure just to injure. It's, it's okay under the law to use weapons that are uh, intended to kill, but things like uh, chemical weapons, so sarin gas, anthrax, mustard gas, uh, those, those weapons of, of World War I in the trenches, uh, those weapons that are designed by their very nature, they are intended uh, to, to cause uh, superfluous wounds, to cause uh, suffering in the target, those are prohibited by law. You also have a component of this principle that outlaws uh, the, the use of, of lawful means of warfare that are intended to cause unnecessary suffering. So by that, I mean taking a perfectly legal means of warfare. So, so say a, a rifle uh, during armed conflict, nothing patently illegal uh, about a rifle, uh, certainly a, a mainstay of armed conflict going back uh, decades and decades. If you were to use that weapon in a way that you intend to cause unnecessary suffering, so say uh, shoot, intentionally shooting someone uh, in, in a vulnerable area, like their knee, uh, to, to knowing that you're 
purpose is to cause them suffering, uh, to cause them superfluous injury, that is unlawful, even though the weapon that you're using is legal. So there's that two pronged approach there or application of unnecessary suffering. Next slide. Flamethrowers is a good example of, of the latter part of it. There's uh, sort of a myth that, that flamethrowers are just an, a patently illegal weapon that they can't be used. And while they're not uh, really employed widely in militaries these days, uh, there, there's no outright ban on the use of flamethrowers. What you can't use uh, them for is, as I described before, you can't use a flamethrower in a way that's intended to cause unnecessary suffering. So you couldn't you know, target a human being or, or something like that intending uh, to, to uh, you know, really cause them suffering. So I, how you use a flamethrower in, in a lawful manner is, is probably, a, or that, that question is probably a reflection of it, their limited use on the battlefield these days. Um, but the weapon itself is not outright illegal. Next slide. I'll pass it back to Taya. Thanks so much for uh, enduring my, uh, my spiel here. And I really appreciate all of you coming. Taya, take it away. Thank you so much, Thomas, Ogden, both of you. I, I don't see any questions in the chat that have not been answered, but if anyone wants to drop anything now is your final chance while I keep talking. Um, I will also drop the um, the diagram that I was talking about in the next week's chat, just because we are running a little over already, which I should have known having both Ogden and Thomas on in the same um, class. They just have so many great stories. And I'm really glad that you got to hear some of these great anecdotes to help you sort of make this material come to live, uh, come alive too. And we will have Thomas back next um, week, in fact, where he'll go into what he mentioned uh, about his background in the, in the military and his experience there. And then we'll have Amy, who was supposed to be on today, but then had to go on for the next one. Um, and then we'll probably uh, have me again for whatever part uh, parts aren't covered. Uh, I'm really glad to see that so many of you showed up and that you participated. I've, we've had a really lively uh, chat and uh, hopefully next time we'll be able to see you too. If not, uh, keep putting things in the chat and keep uh, uh, just making this, bringing tips and tricks like you have been and, um, and making this material come alive. Any parting thoughts from you, Ogden? Nothing. He he gave you the, he gave you the sign off. So I'll uh, I'll say thank you for tonight, and then we'll come back same time next Monday and tackle the next part. And to close this out, I just dropped in the chat. We'll, we'll stay. We'll keep the the webinar active for a couple of minutes. If you have not registered for nights two or three, I just dropped the two registration links into the chat. So June 19th, uh, a week from today, as Taya mentioned, is night two. And then a week from then, June 26th, is night three. So you can sign up using those links. If you have colleagues, if you have others that, that you think might be interested in this sort of thing, it doesn't matter that they missed tonight. That's OK. We would welcome them to night two or three. And we, we're, we really appreciate all of you coming out tonight. Thanks. <laughs>